Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome, everyone, to Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. This is a Catholic Variety program broadcasting out here on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio in Jackson, Michigan. And I am Philip Campbell, your host and the voice on the other end of the speaker for the next half hour. Thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of Faith Matters. Now, What's really neat about the Catholic faith is if is the way that it uh, it just takes so many different forms across different cultures over time. For example, we can think of Polish Catholicism or Italian Catholicism or German Catholicism or Mexican Catholicism, and it's all the same faith. It's all the same body of beliefs, but it's very diversified based on the the culture that embraces the faith that lets the faith transform it and reorient it towards towards Christ. In the old days we used to call this Christianization, now they call it enculturation, but it's the way that that culture embraces the faith and how the faith in turn uh, expresses itself through culture. And one of the most probably vibrant cultural expressions of Catholicism in Western history at least comes from Ireland. We think about Irish Catholicism, of course, Irish Catholicism has deep roots in in the United States, where there was um, massive amounts of Irish immigration that changed the character of the church here. But if we go back earlier into the into the first millennium of the Christian faith, Ireland played a profound role in the passing on of the faith uh, between the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages in in preserving ancient wisdom. We've, we've talked about the church in Ireland before on this program, but today we're going to look at one very particular expression of Irish Catholicism, which is, which is Irish art, Celtic Catholic art, uh, specifically from the Middle Ages, and, uh, and Celtic illumination, and the beautiful contributions that Catholics of Ireland made to the uh, artistic heritage of the church. And uh, so, but it's not going to be me doing all the talking. I've got a, a wonderful guest with me today, a, a longtime friend and uh, aficionado of, of Celtic art, Amanda Danziger. She is a Catholic artist whose paintings and ink drawings are influenced by early medieval illuminated manuscripts. She worked as a full-time graphic designer before becoming a full-time homeschooling mom of five, still doing her art projects wedged in between the nap times and late nights. And Amanda is joining us all the way from Seattle, Washington today. Welcome to Faith Matters, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I've really wanted to dig into this subject for a while because I'm a big fan of traditional Irish Catholicism. Uh, remember, you you did the cover for my uh, edition of the, the Life of St. Columba that I published years ago. Um, yes. Uh, which I still love the, the art you did on that. Um, so okay. I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about um, just to flesh out some some principles of, uh, of of what constitutes Celtic art. But first, in your in your bio, you mentioned illu- medieval illumination or illuminated manuscripts. I guess um, help us understand what does illumination refer to? What does that mean? Well, um, illuminated manuscripts, um, they basically got their name from uh, the gold leaf used to embellish the early medieval manuscripts. So they would have text and it would be decorated with um, gold leaf and illustrations. And gold leaf is basically, if you've never seen it um, before, it's like a thin sheet of gold that's glued down to the page and then it's uh, smoothed down and burnished to reflect the light. And you can kind of imagine the spiritual effect of looking at one of these pages and flickering candlelight, and then seeing the words of sacred scripture come alive with light. So these are literally, like in the very literal sense, they're glowing in candlelight? Yeah, that's right. Wow, that is, that's amazing. Now, this, uh, this obviously must have been a very, preci- a very skilled, uh, just a very precise skill, and I imagine that... They, the scholars probably had to train for a long time to learn this at the various monastic school. Did they, did they have like a, did they see a spiritual meaning behind this too? Like, did they, they have a, uh, a spiritual interpretation of what they were doing? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure there, there must have been, um, you know, with the, 
the light, you know, um, Christ is the light of the world. And uh, they they especially like to um, illustrate that opening passage of uh, St. John's Gospel. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, they, they basically had a, a team of monks working on these in a monastic scriptorium, and you had a scholar monk at the head kind of serving as the copy editor and art director. And then you had a... Re- you know, a team of scribes that were really skilled at writing the text. And then you had the illuminator whose job it was to um, add all the little illustrations and decorative elements that kind of support the text and illustrate what it's about. And so, and, the, you know, they're kind of like the first graphic designers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, the, these, uh, I imagine, gosh, the amount of labor that went into this, these these manuscripts must have been extremely valuable or expensive, Oh, yeah, it would take, um, you know, I, I read that a really large manuscript could take up to 300 calfskins to prepare. Um, so it's not like, you know, just buying a paperback at the local bookstore. <laughs> you had to have a like an enormous flock of animals, and then there was a very time-consuming process to prepare their hides. And um, mixing all the ink and the different pigments used to paint it. Right, because what a lot of people don't realize is these uh, these books were not done on paper as we know it. They'd be done on uh, on vellum or or parchment, and and vellum in particular that's uh, that's like the hide of an animal, right? That's that's scraped and treated, and and you said three hundred yeah, exactly. of them, three hundred in one <laughs> one large book, right? Right. Wow. So um, we're talking about Celtic art in particular, and. Celtic art is very interesting. It's one of these things where, like, when I look at it, I know it when I see it. <laughs> like, I, I can say, oh, that's in the Celtic right. style. But, like, if you were to ask me what defines the Celtic style, I'd probably not be able to explain it. Um, could you help flesh that out? What are some unique stylistic elements of Celtic art in particular? Sure. Well, it's a little hard not to see it, but, um, like, to begin with, in early pagan Celtic art, um, you see a lot of... Um, like metalwork, um, like brooches and things that were decorated with um, like interconnected spirals and um, geometric key patterns. And there's some things that were decorated with these um, interlaced animal designs, um, mm. kind of like what you would think of as Norse Viking art. Yeah. So um, they were doing already a lot of really creative things. Um, but then when the uh, uh, the Romans kind of pushed north up into the British Isles a little bit um, and brought Christianity with them. Um, there's just this huge explosion of creativity from there. Um, there's uh, the the Romans in their, their homes, they had these kind of intricate mosaic floors mm-hmm. in their villas, and um, they had these uh, kind of interlaced borders going around the edges. And some people think that these inspired the Celts in the British Isles to create some more um, complex interlace designs of their own. And so you start seeing um, all of these large stone carved crosses. Like in Ireland, you have the standing high crosses with these, you know, elaborate um, knotwork designs. And then in Scotland, you have these big boulders that are carved with crosses and spirals and things like that. So, and then by the time, uh, you know, a few hundred years go by and they start uh, producing these illuminated manuscripts in their monasteries. All, all of these uh, four stylistic elements are really highly developed, and they they come together in a really amazing and dynamic way. So you have um, parts of the page divided up in in places. There's spirals, and there's key patterns, and there's interlaced animals, and there's knotwork, kind of tying it all together. Yeah, I think that that's a really good explanation, and I th- I think. That's probably what comes to my head when I think of Celtic stuff is like the knot work, the geometric borders, the the spirals and uh, and and stuff like that. Um, so when they're doing these works, I mean, so today we're used to like you buy a book, right? And every copy of the book is going to be exactly the same, right? Because um, it's just right. mass produced. But in those days, every single manuscript is going to be like an individual production, right? I mean, you can copy it, but everyone's going to be almost personalized, right, based on the artist and the skill level of who is creating it? Yeah, yeah. And there's um, 
some of the uh, Celtic manuscripts, there's the really popular ones that are really intricate and beautiful. And then there's some maybe lesser one knowns that aren't quite as intricate, but they're still pretty amazing. And then you, you see some of these designs kind of spill out into the rest of Europe and they, um, they look kind of clunky, but <laughs> yeah. they're still, um, you know, Celtic inspired um, interlace and knots and even like Spanish manuscripts. This really puts into perspective. I know you you know the story, but um, uh, you remember the story where where Saint Columba tried to tried to copy the the Psalter of Saint Finian. Uh, Finian had an illuminated Psalter that was like the renown oh, yeah. the the renown of of Ireland, and and Columba <laughs> tried to copy it, and and Finian tried to retrieve the copy. He said nobody can copy this. <laughs> he he wanted he wanted to have the only copy because it was so so marvelously wrought. And uh, and of course they had. Yeah, they he up... said this. <laughs> he said the calf belongs to the cow that it came from. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And you know what's funny is that uh, that doesn't make sense until, or it makes more, <laughs> it makes more sense when you realize that the book is literally coming from a calf, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they they end up having a, a physical uh, confrontation <laughs> over it, which ends up sending Columba into exile in Scotland and bringing a whole other country to the faith. But uh, just such right. a, a, f- a fun, bizarre story. And I, I think the ironic thing about it is uh, Finian's Psalter, as far as I know, has been lost to history, but Columba's copy still exists, or the, a page of it at least. <laughs> um, so a few uh, a few months ago on this program, I had another uh, woman, Donna Nelson. She was a uh, a writer of icons in the Byzantine uh, tradition, and she was telling us how in Byzantine iconography, not just the very stylistic elements, but there's specific kind of rules or like an inner logic that the iconographer is expected to follow, uh, like Christ is supposed to be, uh, you know, depicted wearing, you know, purple or red shoes, or you only use these colors, or there was certain rules, you know, that the iconographer is supposed to follow to maintain the unity of the style. And is there anything like that in, uh, in Celtic art, or is it more loose in terms of the rules? Yeah, I, um, I wouldn't say that it has um, all those very uh, regimented rules, though I I really appreciate um, hearing about those in Byzantine iconography. Um, I think there's definitely um, stylistic similarities between the different illuminated manuscripts that you see and different designs that they have in common. But, um, you know, since it's not a, a living tradition in the same way that Byzantine iconography is, um, if there were, like, um, very specific meanings to some of the symbolism, we just mm-hmm. don't know anymore. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different um, creative variation between different manuscripts. So I, I think that um, what, what ties them together overall, um, at least in my mind, is that there's this sense that there's... Um, this hidden order to the universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, Celtic designs are so um, they're so dynamic and active visually. <laughs> yeah. But they're they're all um, uh, constrained by this um, hidden grid that you can't see, <laughs> and it, it's kind of a metaphor for the spiritual life, where um, you know the, there's just so much going on, but it's all you know guided by the hand of God and His providence and His plan. Yeah, and is that kind of I mean, I think that's why Irish Catholicism was so brilliant, uh, so vibrant, because the 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 Gales, just on their own, even before Catholicism, had such a rich appreciation for the reality of the spiritual world. It was a very real, very it, it was always there behind whatever visible reality they were looking at. The spiritual realm was always there, always present. Um, right. and, and then when the church came and kind of illuminated what that spiritual realm was. It just kind of wedded the natural Gaelic spirituality with the truths of the Catholic faith and brought forth this amazing, rich uh, artistic heritage. And would you say that's maybe? I mean, I know maybe we're reading back into this, but you know, maybe that's the meaning of the the knots and the the geometric designs, the swirls. It's like the hidden spiritual unity behind all things. Yeah, I think so too. Definitely, I mm. think that's that's the appeal of it. One thing I've noticed about looking at. Um, Celtic manuscripts um, is that uh, the the I noticed the characters have larger eyes um, than maybe other medieval manuscripts. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, I've 
I've heard that, um, you know, because the Celts were really all over the place. We we think of the Irish and Scottish as being the Celts, but they were mm-hmm. really all, all throughout Europe, even, yep. um, you know, some think that even the Galatians that St. Paul was writing to in Asia Minor were a group of Celts. Yeah. So there's thinking that maybe they were in contact with the Coptic Christians and brought back some of their um, iconography into their artistic style. Oh my gosh, now that is a fascinating theory. Yeah. <laughs> ancient Celts and Ethiopians and Egyptians all, all merging together. Um, so yeah. what are some of your personal, um, I guess, favorite examples of, of medieval Celtic illumination or uh, examples that you recommend that our listeners could look up if they want to see some of exemplars of what we're talking about? Um, well, the, the Book of Kells is, of course, that's the great masterpiece of Celtic art. Um, mm-hmm. That's in Trinity College in Dublin. Yeah. And uh, they recently digitized all of it and put it online. So you can go to the uh, Trinity College Library website and look it up, I think. And um, uh, in there, especially the Christ monogram page, mm-hmm. um, where you have the, the, the chi row, you know, it looks like an X and a P. Yeah. And um, there's just so much going on in there. And every tiny little section, there's like, there's spirals everywhere. There's like a guy's head doing something. There's there's these two cats that are sharing a communion wafer with some mice. <laughs> um, it's just a, so amazing and creative. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's at the point where the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned for the first time in that particular gospel. And so instead of having it just look normal, it just sort of explodes out onto the page, like, <laughs> um, yeah, you just... know, like Christ entering the world and all of the, the life uh, and light that he brings. Yeah, I'm looking at the picture right now, the monogram page with the Cairo, and it is so intricate. Like, it's like you've got the letter and then design, like, uh, like geometric design upon design upon design, and all the color. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't imagine. I mean, imagining the execution of this is one thing, but the planning of it, like, like the person who sat down and said this in their mind, this is what it's going to look like, and uh, and to execute it so flawlessly, and this is just like the the front page of the gospel. It's really <laughs> astonishing. If anybody's listening, go look up the monogram page of the Book of Kells, and you're going to have to zoom in. <laughs> you're going to want to zoom in on it and just look at all these spirals and uh, diamonds and all, and yeah, man, I said cats and all these different things. It's pretty extraordinary. That's just one page of it, and you can view it online at the Trinity College uh, website. Um, now, is the Book of Kells, is that a, a book of the gospels, essentially? Yeah, basically, it's a, a book of the Gospels. It was probably for liturgical use. You know how at the the beginning of the Mass, the procession with the Gospel book that mm-hmm. would have been like that. <laughs> was was Kells a, a monastery? Yeah, it was a, a monastery. I believe founded by Saint Columba. Ah, gotcha. Now, also we have um, we have another book, the Lindisfarne Gospels. You've probably heard of that one. Yes, that's another favorite of mine. <laughs> yeah, now that comes from the. The island monastery of Lindisfarne, which, if I recall, was founded by Saint Aidan, I think. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. So, um, like the Book of Kells, Lindisfarne Gospel is also going to be a liturgical book um, of the Gospels, and a lot of these books—I mean, most of these manuscripts are all going to be liturgical, right? That's why they were so lavish, because they were meant—they they weren't meant to just be flipped through privately in in some monk's cell, right? They're to be used for the public worship of the church in the mass, which is why they are so extravagant. Yes, that's right. Um, so let me ask you this. Why um, why do you think Celtic Christianity, Celtic art, just Celtic spirituality, Irish Christian stuff is so popular? Like you don't see, you don't see a bunch of like, stuff like stuff out there for like uh polish catholicism i mean yeah there's stuff out there for polish catholicism but irish catholicism has a kind of perennial universal appeal that people find delightful um what do you think it Mm -hmm. is about that that draws people well um i i think that our contemporary popular culture there's something majorly missing from it it's you know (laughs) And I I think people feel a longing for um, connection to something ancient Mm. and uh, something beautiful. 
Um, and I, you know, even in our even in our modern culture, there's a big attraction to kind of uh, you know escapist fantasy literature, and people love going to Renaissance fairs and things like this because there's there's something in that that um, just speaks to people's heart. Um, the the beauty and the authentic culture we have we have such a uh, kind of a barren culture where everything is mass produced and made of plastic and <laughs> yeah there's a a loss of connection to the crafts that people used to know how to do and different art forms so I I think all of this really um, really attracts people and with um, Celtic Christianity I think um, I as a Protestant Christian I'm a convert. But as a, a Protestant, I was sort of drawn to this idea of Celtic Christianity because when I went to church, um, you know, to your basic evangelical church, they tried to make it seem like casual and contemporary, and maybe like a coffee house, maybe like a concert. But what I was longing for was this, you know, ancient beauty, yeah. as something transcendent. And so I started, you know, reading about it in you know, reading about the Celts in different Celtic knot art books, you know, trying to learn how to make Celtic knots. And, uh, you know, some some of it is this, um, some of it feeds into this Protestant idea of there was this um, ancient, you know, form of Christianity that wasn't connected to Catholicism, which is a yeah. myth. But, <laughs> but it, you know, it just lets you be connected to the ancient church in a way that feels non-committal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, <laughs> yeah, they want there, there's kind of this myth that uh, that ancient Irish Christianity was not was not Catholic or not connected to the Catholic Church when when I mean both the first bishops to Ireland, Saint Palladius and Saint uh, Patrick, were both commissioned by the Pope personally and sent there, um, by, you know, on a special mission of uh, Pope Innocent. So um, very Catholic right, right from the beginning. But I think people get thrown because it wasn't. It it wasn't the Roman rite necessarily. They were they were using old Gallican rites that Patrick and Palladius had brought over, and then those meshed with the kind of native uh, Irish culture, and it brought forth a unique expression of Catholicism, but Catholicism yeah, exactly. nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, maybe this is maybe you can speak to this, and we have we have about three minutes left. But I've one thing that's frustrating to me is seeing. Um, Irish Christianity or Irish spirituality kind of co-opted by New Age spirituality. Um, have you ever noticed anything like that? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm actually part of a Facebook group called Discussion of Celtic Art. And if anyone else is out there also trying to figure out how to make Celtic art, I'd encourage you to find us. But there, you have Catholics and Protestants and pagans, and we all get along really well because we're all <laughs> trying to work out the same design problems. Yeah. But, you know, I I posted a, a knotwork um, crown of thorns and I had people ask me like, oh, what does this mean to you? Because they, you know, they just had no idea. So it ended up being an evangelism opportunity mm. to, you know, speak to like, well, this is, <laughs> you know, Christianity is where, you know, this design style actually comes from. Yeah, um, yeah. So I've... It's kind of amazing. I've noticed when they make movies, uh, when Hollywood makes movies about like Ireland or Irish history, like the the Christian the Christian heritage of Ireland is given a nod. Like you'll see some monks, you'll see some Catholic churches, you know. But it's like the fairies and the pagan like spirits and stuff are like the real things. <laughs> like like they're right. they're presented <laughs> as real, and then the the Christian stuff is just kind of a veneer. It's like there's a uh, there's a lot of a fascination with the the pre-Christian elements in uh, in Ireland, the the the, uh, the pagan stuff, but um, but not a lot, not as much appreciation in mainstream for the beautiful Catholic heritage of the country, which is sad. Yeah, I think people have just forgotten, or they never learned in their history class in school that, that these are all like Catholic things. This is a Catholic art form. <laughs> yeah, um, so, some of that's fueled by. Um, you know, the Protestant narrative that a lot of people grow up with, with, um, you know, just kind of dismissing all of that as warmed over paganism. But this really is a, a um, an authentic Christian expression in art. Yeah, it And, you know, we, we can own it. So, Amanda, tell us uh, briefly uh, 
about your own work and how people can reach you if they want to check out your art or maybe uh, maybe get in touch with you to produce a piece of art? How can they reach out to you? Sure. Well, um, my email address is on my portfolio website, which is www.ardanziger.com. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram where I update it a lot more often. Um, you know, shots of my new work or my sketches. That's AR underscore Danziger. And I have a Facebook page too, AR Danziger Art and Design. And um, so I, I post pictures of my paintings, my pen and ink drawings. Mm -hmm. um, it's all influenced by um, Romanesque period illuminated manuscripts with some Celtic art in there too. And I love how colorful it is too. Um, now your uh, your website is www ardanziger.com that's a r d a n z i g e r.com and you can check out Amanda's work get in contact with her follower on the various social media platforms Amanda thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us and um and go check her out go check her out guys I've I've worked with Amanda personally before she does great work and uh, I hope you'll give her some support thank you Amanda thanks a lot and, well, until next time, everyone, this has been another episode of Faith Matters with Philip Campbell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you all.